Fellow parents and grandparents, listen up. If you've been less than happy about the amount of time the little people in your life have, been, have spent on electronic devices, tonight's program might just help you start one of the most important conversations in that child's life. And if you've ever found yourself scrolling aimlessly for hours through cat videos, silly hidden pranks, or politicians making not too smart mistakes on camera, you might want to watch this entire show. So don't go away, stay right there. We love technology, don't we? It's, it's allowed my wife Stephanie and me, along with our children, to never miss an important moment with our grandkids, even when miles of ocean are between us. Tech keeps our eating and entertainment preferences organized and reminds us of when it's time to exercise or get more sleep. It allows me to preach every Sunday on social media and keep up with friends from childhood. There's no question that the supercomputer that fits in the palm of our hand is a gift from God, but like many good gifts, it needs to be mastered so it doesn't master us. My guest, Betsy Childs Howard, has written a fun but powerful book, Polly and the Screen Time Overload, designed to help children who are being introduced to technology make good choices, perhaps even better ones than their parents or grandparents. Betsy, I can't wait to, to read this with my, uh, my grandkids. Welcome to State of Independence. Thank you, Jan. It's good to be here. Yeah. Well, to tell, tell our viewing audience about yourself. Uh, I know you're a native of the great state of Alabama uh, and that you're married to a wonderful uh, uh, man from, uh, from the United Kingdom. Uh, but but tell, tell us about yourself. That's correct. Um, my husband's name is Bernard, and he is a pastor and a church planter, and we live in New York where he planted a small Anglican church uh, called Good Shepherd. And we have two little boys. They are two years old and two months old, and they're exhausting. <laughs> yes, I'm sure. A handful, a handful. Yes. Uh, so yes. How, how did you come to write um, uh, children's books? I mean, it's wonderful that you have chosen this medium or that the medium has chosen you, but, but, but tell us how you, your journey to, to, that, to that space. Well, I've always loved children's literature, and um, I've been an editor at the Gospel Coalition for about seven years. And as part of my job, I started working in some children's curriculum and then started overseeing the children's picture book category of TGC Book Awards. So it was a really interesting education in what Christian publishers are putting out for children right now. And there's some wonderful books being put out. But as I looked through these books, I saw some excellent theological resources, teaching resources, but I felt like there was a bit of a hole in the market. And, and that hole was some of the books that I had loved as a child, which were very story driven, were fictional, um, engaged my imagination, but also taught moral lessons. Uh, so I started talking with some of my coworkers about the fact that um, this type of book seemed to be missing from Christian publishing right now. But you know what's not missing is secular publishers are putting out lots of really engaging stories that teach moral lessons. Unfortunately, they're not the moral lessons we want our children to learn. So we started talking about, could we do this without being moralistic? We don't, we never want to be moralistic where we're teaching children, these are the good things. If you do these good things, good things will happen to you. This is how you earn uh, your, your righteousness before God. That's the last thing we want to do. But nor do we want to throw out out the fact that God has given us commands and those commands are good for us. They're life giving. But so all that to say, we wanted to teach children. We wanted to engage their imaginations on subjects that would form them morally. So I now oversee um, a new line of books. I wrote the first two, but we have three more coming out that I didn't write that do that. They engage children's moral imagination while at the same time being story driven. We hope that children will read these books and come away and say, that was a story about Polly or Arlo, not that was a story about technology or sin. So, so that's, that's the idea. That's how I got into it. We have a partnership with Crossway to publish these books and we're just getting started. That's a really great story. Um, uh, so th the subject matter for this book is, is such an important one because uh, it's so real. I mean, uh, I remember a few years ago I was a, uh, I got a new, cell, a new cell phone and my granddaughter, my little granddaughter at the time, uh, took it in and said, and asked me, Papa, is, this, uh, is your phone password protected? 
And I said, what? And she said, is it password protected? And I said, well, I, I don't think so. She says, well, it needs to be. And she just took my phone and, and very quickly dialed something and said, you know, give me a password. And I gave it to her and she said, now you're protected. And you need to use this to open your phone uh, uh, when you have it. So that if somebody ever gets hold of your phone, they won't be able to just go right in and see all your stuff. And I said, wow. I mean, it was just amazing. It seems to me like kids, even young kids, seem to understand how mobile phones work and how computers work um, uh, better than it's, us old folks. It's true. They're digital natives is what people say. <laughs> and, and that is very true. It's, it's um, as natural to them as you know, language learning is to other people, lear learning how to navigate around on a device. So, so I guess the question becomes, uh, you, 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 your point, I mean, without having read the book about Polly, um, it sounds like you're tackling an issue that's an issue for lots of people, which is how do you get kids off their, off their mobile devices, uh, you know, off technology, because uh, uh, there's a tendency to want to be on it 24 seven. And, and then the, 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 I guess part of the challenge for parents is to not use it as a babysitter, uh, which it, it becomes, you know, if you want to keep your kid quiet when you need to do something, especially in this day of virtual meetings on Zoom, you, you, your, your kid may be home, your children may be home with you. you. You need them to be quiet so you can concentrate and take part in your meeting and they aren't making noise in the background. And so you might hand them um, a mobile device and, and say, you know, look at your favorite cartoons or whatever on this. And, and then while they're on that, you can do your meeting. The trouble becomes is that you don't know what they're watching because they may, you know, an ad may pop up and they may hit the button to watch the ad and it may take them to a place that you wouldn't want them to go. And you don't have any control at this point because you're in your meeting and they're on the, on the mobile device unsupervised. But, but tell us a little bit about the book, uh, Polly. Uh, that, you, that you wrote. And what, what inspired you to write this particular book? Well, the, the basic message of the book is that technology is not bad, but it can, we can have too much of a good thing and too much screen time can take our, our taste away from other things that we'll enjoy even more. So in this case, the story is about a little girl named Polly and she goes to visit her grandparents on their farm, which is her favorite thing to do. She's looking forward to all the things she's gonna do there. But the first day she arrives, uh, she's given a tablet device as a birthday present. So she just spends all her time on the tablet. She doesn't uh, ride the horse. She doesn't milk the cow. She doesn't gather eggs. She doesn't play with her cousins because the technology is all consuming. Uh, so what happens to help her kind of snap out of it? The, the device dies and has to be charged. So she goes and talks to her grandfather and they talk about how, um, this is keeping her from doing things that she might enjoy even more. And um, her grandfather uses the example of, you know, she feeds the horse in his stable a sugar cube. Sugar is good. Sugar is tasty. But if you only eat sugar, you won't eat the things that are really good and nourishing. In the same way, the more that we feed ourselves screen time, we will lose our taste for other things. And so while she's thinking about that, she goes and plays with her cousins and they built a a fort out of hay bales and she has a wonderful time and um, I will admit it's not necessarily a realistic turn of events but you know children's picture books don't have to be totally realistic but she then sort of self-governs and decides she's going to put the tablet away for the rest of her visit on the farm so that she can enjoy life so I don't think most kids are capable of making that decision for themselves but hopefully Polly will be an example to them that sometimes it's good to put the device away. And her grandfather says, you know, when you get back to back home, your mom can help you put some limits on this. But so like you said, technology is a good thing. And technology can be really helpful for parents, especially in the case of an emergency or a 12 hour car drive or, you know, a, a last minute meeting that you have to have. But the more we feed our kids screen time, the more they will lose their taste for other things, for imaginative play, for reading books, for um, you know playing outside. So I want to help kids start understanding before they're making their own decisions about technology. I want them to start thinking about the fact that the amount of screen time they have have an effect on them and the time that they're spending on a screen is trade-off time that they could be doing something else. So hopefully, years down the road when they are making their own decisions about this, they'll recognize I need to have some discipline in this area if I want to enjoy all the good gifts God has given me. 
Yeah, that's very, very thoughtful. Uh, very, very thoughtful because uh, oftentimes we don't give thought to uh, the implications of something down the road. And, and, and you're, you've done that, which is, uh, I think, wonderful. Uh, it, what, what are parents saying? What, what do you find um, is the uh, uh, biggest challenge? Do you, what do you think is the biggest challenge for parents uh, when it comes to, to, to getting their kids to, to not use up so much screen time? Well, one challenge is the fact that their peers have so many devices and, and use screens. So when I was growing up, my parents were careful about limiting how much TV we watched, but that was sort of the only issue, TV. You know, now everything we do is on a device, so it's even more challenging for parents. So I think we have to recognize when we put limits on technology, that's not just entertainment, but it's also communication with friends. And I think um, one thing that can be helpful is if you can find other like-minded parents who recognize we want to have this within limits um, and we want our children to be around other children that also have limits on technology. I'm not saying they can't hang out with families that have different standards and rules. And sometimes you might have one rule for while you're at your home, like you might not do devices on weekdays, but it may be that when they go to someone else's house, they're allowed to do that. You know, I'm not for super, super strict, but I think parents have to teach kids that just because all their friends are doing it, doesn't mean they should do it. And that's a lesson they need to learn in many areas of life. Do you have uh, rules in your own house? Uh, I know your kids are, are small still at two and two months, but do you have uh, rules between you and your husband as, to, uh, as it relates to, to use uh, of technology? We don't, but we, we talk about the need for it, with whether it's, uh, and, and it's, that's one of those things that's like, okay, before our boys get a little bit older, we want to, whether it's no phones at the dinner table or um, we, we see that same temptation in ourselves to spend too much time on our devices and we want to get better at that. And we want, it, it's interesting how sometimes having children can help you see, ooh, I'm telling my kid that being on the screen all the time isn't good for them, but I need that lesson myself. <laughs> what, what, what do you say to parents who say, or to people who say, oh, come on, you know, this, this, is, this is harmless uh, technology, it's needed. You know, my kids need to do their homework on it anyway. And, and this is pretty harmless stuff, you know, what, what's, what's the big problem with too much uh, screen time? Well, if, if they look at studies, they'll find out that um, excessive screen time lowers all kinds of scores in terms of your intelligence, your imagination, your creativity. And I have personally just experienced, if I sit on the couch and watch something or scroll through my phone for a long time, it's very soothing to me. It's maybe even slightly addicting. When I finish that, I don't have a lot of creative energy. It's just one small indicator that it's not serving me well, as opposed to other things like taking a walk, reading a book, cooking a meal, having a good conversation with a friend face to face. Those things energize me and help me to engage with the real world rather than just scrolling mindlessly. So I think if you think about the effect that your phone, your screens has on your relationship, your own creativity, that's a small indicator of what it has on your children. And just one small example, my, my son's two, he's only just, you know, becoming conversant. He loves to look at pictures on my phone. When I take that away, he he just cries as if it's as if I'm taking away his his life source. You know that it has this un um, unexplainable grip on it. our phones do. And I didn't have a phone when I was two. My son doesn't have a phone. He's mine. But you know, like if we start, if 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 he, it has that level of grip on him at two, just imagine what it will have when he's eighteen. So that's to me motivation to want to limit it. Yeah, yeah. Tell me about, uh, in writing the book, uh, how did you choose the illustrator and the illustration style? Well, this is the second book that I've written that has the same illustrator. So when we started off with the first book and had the partnership with Crossway, uh, their art department asked me for suggestions for illustrators, if there were any illustrators that I knew that I liked. So I had the really pleasurable task of going through and picking out some excellent children's books with wonderful illustrations to send to them to show this is a style that I liked. And one thing that was important to me is that the illustrations be very detailed because I remember as a child being read to, and I think the books that children like to read over and over often have really interesting detailed illustrations. So the more times you read it, the more things you notice. So I sent the art department um, some 
examples of illustrations. And they found Samara Hardy, she's um, a British uh, illustrator, and sent me some examples of her work. And then we asked her to do a sample sketch. We paid her to do a spread to show us what she would make uh, the characters in this, this book look like. And I loved it. So she illustrated my first book, which was called Arlo and the Great Big Cover-Up. And did an excellent job with that. And we had back and forth. She would send pencil sketches. I've never met her. I didn't actually interact with her directly, but through the art department. She would send pencil sketches. I would make suggestions, and she would send colored versions. And it's a, it's a really fabulous thing to get to write a story and watch it to come to life through someone else's illustrations. Yeah, I, 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 uh, I remember as a kid, I used to love the pictures uh, uh, from the, some of these children's books. And uh, some of them were so creative. Uh, and wonderful, they, they kind of stick with you. And they remember you, they keep help you to remember everything that the book said, all the, all the, the verse, uh, the important uh, writing uh, that, that took place. You, you haven't only written children's books, you've written for, for adults as well. Yes, I have a book called Seasons of Waiting that came out in 2016. Right, so what made you, how, how, did, you, how did you decide that kids were the ones that you wanted to write to for this message? Well, there is a lot out there for adults on technology. There's podcasts, there's articles, there's books, um, really good resources for how to try to rein in technology. But there's very little at the picture book level, which is for good reason, because most kids are not managing their own consumption of technology at that age. But I firmly believe that you want to start talking about something with your kids before it's a live issue. So I think a great conversation starter is stories in children's books. So I thought, well, we need something out there about screen time to start talking about it with children before they're making their own decisions. And even now, as, as a mother, I am making decisions for my children, and I want to talk to them about why I'm making those decisions. I'm not just just saying, nope, enough screen time. I'm, I'm going to say this is why. When you, when you watch too much TV, if you... Um, you know, only play video games, you don't want to do this and you love doing this. And, you know, so just starting that conversation as early as possible, I think is a good setup for them making wise choices by the time they're adults. Yeah. What about your own journey? Um, is there anything in your own journey that, that uh, I mean, this, you're, you're a Christian person uh, writing children's books. That's, that's even a little bit different from people who just write children's books in, in general. So, so you, you have a, a faith. Is there anything about your journey that, that led you to, to using your gifts this way? Well, definitely. On, on the issue of technology, the Bible uh, really lifts up self-control as an important fruit of the Holy Spirit. And um, that affects many, many different areas of our life, how we use our tongue, how we eat, how we you know, spend our money, all those kinds of things need self-control, but technology really needs this. And um, self-control is not exclusive to Christianity, but Christians have the motivation. We want to be like our Savior. We want to walk in the light, so we want to exercise self-control. And we also recognize that um, messages are coming to us and to our children through the media that we consume. So we want to be very careful and very um, thoughtful about what sort of influences we feed each other, because we want to have a mind that's renewed and, and we want to um, think like God thinks and have a biblical worldview. So I think all of those things make Christians and Christian parents and hopefully Christian children think more deeply about the way we use technology. Wonderful. When we return, I want to ask Betsy to get very practical with parents and grandparents. Stay with us. You're watching Joe Watkins State of Independence on Lighthouse TV, positively different. Share your comments about today's program in the comment box at joewatkins.org. I'm with uh, Betsy Childs Howard, an editor of the popular web website, The Gospel Coalition, and the author of several books, including the beautifully illustrated one we're discussing today, Polly and the Screen Time Overload. You can follow her on Twitter at Betsy Howard, uh, at Betsy C. Howard, or see much of her work at thegospelcoalition.org. Make sure that you, you dial that up on the, look that up on the, on your computer. Um, Betsy, um, tell me, you know, it's always tricky when you're a Christian person. Um, it, it's, it's easy to become preachy. Uh, I know this because I'm a preacher. Um, but, but how do you, uh, as an author, um, get your point across without being judgmental? You know, uh, how do you reach the parent who is 
quick to take offense and, and, or, and, and who in, in many instances might think, well, you're judging me because I let my kids just kind of go do their own thing with these, these, these cell phones. Uh, how do you keep from, from being judgmental uh, in, in, in writing stories like this one? Well, I hope um, that readers will see that the perspective of the book really sympathizes with Polly. I know how hard it is. I know that pull of the glowing screen. You know, there's one illustration where it's late at night and her face is like cool blue light on it. You know, it's, it's something that we're all drawn to. And the book really um, makes the, the point that technology is not bad. It's not wrong. But um, the Bible says, all things are lawful, but not all things are helpful, not all things build up. And so I really want people to see that this is not, technology use is not a sin in and of itself. But if we don't have boundaries to it, it'll take over our lives. So hopefully they'll see this is a message of just trying to help you have freedom so that you use technology, it doesn't use you. Um, so I hope as they read this and they see that I understand the pull of technology, they can identify with Polly who's pulled into this, but they also like her, maybe even more so than her, can choose to set it aside in favor of doing something else when the time is right. Yeah, well, you're very talented to be able to do this, uh, of course, and this is a gift from God, and we're glad that you're using the gifts God has given you. Um, you you've probably got some other projects, I'm sure, uh, as a writer, uh, since you've been written, written for, for um, adults as well as for kids. Uh, tell us about some of the other book projects you've got. Well, um, Right now, my main project is a two-month-old, <laughs> which is <laughs> a lot of the other time for creative endeavor. Um, I do I do try to think about them and sort of do some writing in my head, but um, child care is scarce and computer time is hard. So I have some ideas, but it'll probably be a, a year or two down the road before I can put some of those into practice. But we do have some other books coming out through the same series. We Our next one is called Meg is Not Alone, and that is a book by Megan Hill, and it is about um, the church. So it's actually um, a fictional version of a true story that happened to Megan, which she left was left at church when she was a little child, accidentally by her parents. But what? in the story, Megan learns wow. that the church is her family, and they took care of her in that situation. You know, for the few minutes until her parents could come back and get her. So there's there's some great, even though I, I don't have another book right now in the pipeline, there's some great books coming from Megan and a couple of other authors in this series. Yeah, that's right. So what do you say to young people, uh, people who might uh, look up to you and say, you know, I, I would love to do this for a living. I'd love to be able to, you know, I, I think I have the same gift that Betsy has. I, I'd love to use it, uh, uh, my gift as a Christian person, uh, and, and also be paid for it because you know, there's something to be said for for being successful and getting compensated for what you do. Uh, what, what would you say to a young person who's contemplating a career like yours as a, as, a, as a writer, or maybe even as an illustrator for children's books? Well, I feel like God has really blessed me with opening doors that I didn't necessarily deserve, whether it's just running into the right people at the right time. There's a lot of talented people, more talented people than I am that may not have some of the doors open just um, because of circumstances. But I, I would say if, if they have an interest in children's books, um, one thing that I think is very important is to really let your imagination run with the story rather than focus too much on the message. You want a good message to come through, but you, like you said, you don't want a book to be preachy, especially a book for children, because they'll read it once and toss it aside. Um, but as far as uh, getting published, relationships are how that happens. So if, if, they, their, cross, if their path crosses with a professor that has connections in publishing or someone at their church where they take illustration classes in college, using those relationships are, are the way that doors typically open for people in publishing. Yeah, that ha is that how it happened for you? It is, yes. It, I mean, I, um, different, different steps along the way, but a key piece was the way I came to work at the Gospel Coalition was because I was living in Birmingham, which is where I'm from originally. Colin Hansen, who is now the vice president for editorial content for TGC, moved to Birmingham because his wife was also from there. So we just became friends first. And then I, I started writing for the Gospel Coalition. And then um, when I moved to New York, I asked him if he would give me a job because I had to leave the job that I was doing in Birmingham. So that's how those doors started opening for me for publishing um, and, and eventually children's books. Well, thank you, Betsy. Thank you for writing this book for all of us. Uh, we really appreciate it. I hope you enjoy it. Yeah, absolutely. Friends, I hope you go out and buy Polly and the Screen Time Overload at thegospelcoalition.org or wherever you buy good books online. I'll be back with our producer, Jeff Coleman, with closing thoughts. 
Learn more about Joe Watkins and the mission of this program at joewatkins.net. And tell Joe what you thought about today's program in the comment box. Well, now let's talk to our great producer, Jeff Coleman. Well, every time a new technology comes out, you know, you have to think through all of the implications of, of how it changes your life. And even when new updates to phones or to systems come out, you have to think through it. And I don't know that we were ready, you know, a decade ago for how technology was going to change our life, how it was going to change everything from, you know, the bedtime stories to your car experience to what school would look like, but it, technology has changed. I'm glad she wrote the book. Yeah, yeah, me too. Do you find yourself reaching for your phone all the time? I mean, reaching? No, I, I have no yeah. problem with technology yeah. over, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> yeah, I, you do, in a lull, what yeah. do you do? When, when it gets quiet, you reach for your phone. Yeah. You, know, you might have, back in the day, reached for the, the radio to fill in space, and we're having fewer and fewer spaces where there's quiet. Yeah. When we're just, you know, I mean, that's one of the things about Lighthouse TV I think people like is that there are moments when you turn on Lighthouse TV and you see song and scripture. Yeah, that's right. And it's quiet. Yeah. And uh, you need those times of reflection. So I think getting what Betsy is doing is getting people to think very early in life about how you uh, can be trading uh, a not so kind of candy for a meal and for, for the good stuff of life. Uh, yeah. And I think we're missing out on a lot of good things. Yeah, well, it's so hard, you know, even uh, now if you have a tablet or an iPad uh, and you have all the different apps on it, right. you know, you might have an app for, like uh, Netflix has cartoons, right. uh, kid cartoons. And so you, you, my, my grandkids uh, grabbed my iPad and went right to Netflix and pulled up their favorite cartoon. Right. And were able to sit and watch uh, their cartoon. Which allows you to have conversation. Yes. And it kind of frees you up. Yeah. Well, but, I, and I watch with them. I watch yeah. with them too. I think that's what, one of the things she said. One of the things we try to do in our house with our four kids is, if something's on the screen, talk about it. Don't just make it a passive exercise. Right. Right. Well, you're a good dad. Good dad. Good mom. That's a good thing. Yeah. That's a good thing. You are too. Well, thanks, brother. Thanks. Thanks. Well, that's all the time we have for today's State of Independence. We love helping you think through and discuss the things that shape our view of the world around us. Thanks to my guest, Betsy Howard. Please take a minute to drop me a line or two in the comment box at joewatkins.org to let me know if this program was, was encouraging and helpful to you. They certainly helped me and everyone here at Lighthouse TV to know that we're equipping you to love the Lord with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and your neighbor as yourself. That's our mission. From America's first capital, Philadelphia, I'm Joe Watkins. Thanks so much for watching. God willing, I'll see you next week. I love children's books. Yeah, this Especially was good ones. Yeah, it was a good one. And the detail yeah. and the illustration. Yeah, yeah. yeah very exciting. Yeah, great guest. Looking forward to seeing her other books, too. Yeah. Joe Watkins' State of Independence is a production of Lighthouse TV, positively different. Made possible in part because of the support of viewers like you.